Hello and welcome inside the WOSN studios. It's that time of the week again. Thank you for joining us on Press Row. We're joined by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Guys, we had week nine circled on the high school football calendar back in the summer because of one game in particular, the Doug Fry Bowl, St. Mary's and Wapakoneta. Doug Fry returns to Wapak. He'll be on the visitor's sideline. So can St. Mary's spring the upset on undefeated Wapak? I shouldn't say can. Will they? A month ago, I thought they might have that possibility, but the way Wapakoneta has played the last couple of weeks, Wapakoneta kind of got over that little hump. We saw them beginning of the season where they were kind of letting teams linger. They put away OG quickly last week, and I, I don't think this is going to be a close game. If it is, if Wapak's going to lose in the regular season, St. Mary's and Doug Fry, I think, has got the game plan to do it. I just don't think they're going to be quite good enough to overcome a very good Wapak team. By far the most emotional week on the St. Mary's slash Wapakoneta calendars. Uh, from a football perspective. More uh, emotional than St. Mary's Salina? I would think so. I, I would still think so. There's still that lingering effect, you know, to some of those. They don't break the huddle saying beat Wapak. That's true. They break the huddle saying beat Salina. And they, they still have the towels in the weight room that say beat Salina. They have some that say beat Wapak. I've seen them both. <laughs> that being said, though, this matchup, looking at it, I, you know, a month ago, I just said going to be very close. This way, I don't think so. Now, granted, St. Mary's is playing for their playoff lives. They're ranked seventh right now in their division and in their region, and they've got to win this week. Wapak on a mission. I like Wapak big. Yeah, I like Wapak in this game too, but I do think the recipe is there for St. Mary's. They're the type of team that can, can upset people. If they can get the ball first, score, and be ahead or even or close throughout the game, I think they can stay in it. But Wapakoneta does seem to be hitting their stride and really impressive last week against OG. I don't picture St. Mary's winning, but I think they have it in them, and you can never underestimate that rivalry factor. And I still think there are plenty of uh, frontline guys that played for Coach Fry at Wapakoneta and now guys from St. Mary's that remember him there to be just enough of a factor. But, I mean, I'll take Wapakoneta. When Wapak has struggled this season, it's because the other team has controlled the clock and run the ball. And that's something that St. Mary's does pretty well, so that might favor them in this matchup. But like you guys, I think Wapak's going to be too strong. I might be shortchanging him a win or two, but I'm pretty sure it's 76 straight regular season victories for Coach Travis Moore. So that is not only very impressive, but that's a streak I'm sure he would like to continue in a big rivalry oh, yeah, game. And Wapak themselves have won 26 in a row yes. regular season games and 24 league games. So uh, I figure all three of those streaks are going to continue. Well, I'm a senior in the track title. That's something that they've been reaching for for all these years, and they've never won an outright, outright track title. This could be the year they get at least a share, though. We'll have a big matchup week 10. Who do you think is going to be the winners of the track when it's all said and done? Well, I guess I'm going, to, I'm going to say Lima Senior just because I think uh, they've got it in them. I, I like the way their defense has come along lately. Central Catholic is very, very good, but I don't think they're unbeatable. I think Lima can go up there next week and beat them. I think it's nice that Lima gets a off week this week with <laughs> Oregon Clay. I know you never look past anybody, but we can look past Oregon Clay. Lima will beat them. They should be fully prepared, as physically rested, and ready to go for that Week 10 game. Uh, Central Catholic pay, plays St. John's this week. That'll yep. give them a test. So uh, I think things are pointing toward Lima getting over the hump. I, I certainly hope they can. I think they have the ability to do it in two weeks. I think Whitmer is also going to get a share of that track title. As, sure, as yeah, you mentioned, they would. you've got Central Catholic with St. John's and Lima Sr. Uh, Whitmer has got Finley this week. They get past the Trojans. I believe they have either St. Francis or Clay Week 10. So Whitmer, I think, should win out as well. So I, I think you're going to have Whitmer with one loss, very real possibility of Lima Sr. and Salido Central Catholic all with one loss as well, sharing the league title. Yeah, yeah. and now this week is a good week for the Spartans to work on some of those things in preparation. And I'm sure Mike Fell is going to put some things on film just to put them out there on film to make Central Catholic prepare for them. Greg Dempsey does an outstanding job with that program in the 13, 14, however many years he's been the head coach. It's, you know, it's not nothing that he hasn't seen before. But if the Lima senior defense can dial it back just like they did last week, Todd, you saw them. If they can continue to ball hawk and play aggressive football, and more importantly, stay healthy this week, they've got a legit chance to knock off Central Catholic. That's going to be a good matchup. Yeah, I think, I think Lima Sr. found something defensively. I haven't seen them be that aggressive, really, even any of the last two years. 
I think they just decided to unleash their athletes and, and see what happens. And it worked well against St. John's. Uh, who knows if it'll continue to work against Central Catholic, but I think they found a little bit different mentality with their defense, and I think it'll help them going forward. And Coach Fell credits uh, defensive coordinator Frank Crea sure. for drying up blitzes and using those athletes. And what they did last week was really impressive given what the Titans quarterback did to them last year, throwing for over 500 total, mm -hmm. racking up 500 total yards of offense. And this year, what they hold them to, like 160? Yeah, they did a great job. And, and St. John's had been doing that this year up to this point. So, you know, it, it was a good defensive performance. I mean, they're not the steel curtain. Let's, let's not go overboard. <laughs> no. But... I think they've found an identity defensively, and we've been waiting for that for a year and a half now. And I think maybe defensively they got a little bit of mojo going now. We know the offense will be there, so the defense may be finally catching up. That could bode well for the Spartans. A couple big games in the NWCC this week, or at least one big game, in that there's a three-way tie at, at top the league right now. Will we have a shared title in this league, and who will share it? Well, it seems almost inevitable right now that because Riverside is lost. I think they're probably the, the best team there, but they do have a loss. And the, the math just seems to be working out now where you're going to have a shared championship. Uh, Fort Loramie USV, that's like an elimination game. So, But it would appear that there's going to be at least a co-championship. I concur. Nice. As you should always. <laughs> I, I, it's been interesting to see the way the NWCC has kind of played out this year. Where the teams that we thought were going to be the better teams in the NWCC got off to a slow start in the non-conference schedule, and certainly a fantastic start for Harden Northern. They've kind of come back to earth, and now we're coming down to, to Riverside, Fort Loramie, and USV, and Lehman Catholic, the teams we, we kind of thought some of those were going to be in the mix at the start of the year. So it'll be interesting the last couple of weeks to see how it all plays out. But yeah, I, I think Todd's right. When you look at the Geography, the geometry and the, the algebra of the entire thing, it, it's going to end up a, a shared title. Whoa, I'm, whoa. I'm going to take your arithmetic. I didn't say anything about algebra. I'm, I'm just inferring. Oh, okay. Team I'm X a... beats Team Y, equal okay. then or lesser than Team Y to the second power. Gotcha. Your bilateral equation multiplied by pi gives me the following answer. Riverside and whoever wins between USV and Fort Loramie shares the title. That's good. That's good math. I like that. Yeah. Way to go. Yeah, those years of hanging out with you have paid <laughs> off. <laughs> All right, let's go to college football now. Buckeyes still ranked number one, still unbeaten, but a big change coming up this week. JT Barrett will start at quarterback. So will Cardell Jones take another meaningful stat for the Buckeyes in his Ohio State career? Well, I guess you're, by meaningful, you mean with the game on the line. I guess you could define it different ways. I think they're going to try and keep him somewhat involved because I think mentally they're worried if he doesn't play at all he's going to check out although last year he came yeah. in and did the job but but now he if he comes into games as the man let's say JT would get hurt he can't come in like last year and be carefree and just be Cardale and do all that stuff because now there's film on him and we see how people are trying to attack that Ohio State offense when he's leading it but I do think he'll see some meaningful action but I also agree with the move to go to JT Barrett I think this team, especially as it's built right now, is better suited with Barrett at quarterback. I'm not saying that Cardale isn't good or can't be good, but I think right now JT's the better option. You know, the, the telltale thing to me, and maybe I'm overanalyzing this, I don't know, but you've got JT Barrett who was voted a captain. Obviously his teammates think enough of him from a leadership perspective and what he brings to the table. Right now, I think he's the best fit for the huddle. I have no, pro you know, Cardale has struggled at times mightily. You, you realize they don't actually huddle anymore, right? Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's a figure of speech metaphor. Neither does my flag football team, by the there way. We go. don't yeah. huddle either. Nonetheless, no flag football talk here. <laughs> JT, overall, better move right now. Will Cardale see the field? Yes. I disagree with both of you. I know Urban Meyer said they're going to work on a package for Cardale Jones this week for Rutgers. Unless you've got Noah Brown suddenly getting miraculously healed, there's no reason to put Cardell Jones in at quarterback. The entire point of having Cardell Jones at quarterback was to stretch the field horizontal, vertically to the deep threat. That deep threat went down before the season began when Noah Brown broke his leg. Paris Campbell getting hurt, Corey Smith getting hurt, did not help the situation at all. Cardell Jones excelled because he could throw the deep ball. If you don't have anybody who can catch the deep ball, there's no point in throwing the deep ball. So until Ohio State develops a deep threat, there's no point for Cardell Jones to come into the game and take a meaningful snap. In fact, if we get into later in the season, the second half of November, if they bring in a different quarterback, it'll be Braxton Miller. Braxton Miller will throw a downfield pass mm -hmm. this season for Ohio State. I think they're waiting for his shoulder to get a little bit stronger, and then they're going to start unleashing the Braxton Miller 2.0 quarterback slash wide receiver. Will he throw a jump pass? 
He might the jump pass. <laughs> that was I, actually that was at JT Barrett's call to the, use the jump pass. I, I agree full 100 percent about Braxton mm -hmm. Miller. I do Sooner too. or later, he's going to throw some passes. But the other thing is, where you were going, I thought you were going to go to here. Why risk Cardale Jones getting hurt? Because now, if you go to JT Barrett, if he gets hurt, you need a backup. So you know, you I don't have know no if faith you just Stephen Collier. They're not going to burn uh, Burrow's red shirt. I mean, Stephen Collier took his red shirt last year, so you got four years of Stephen Collier coming up. And if we know anything about this Ohio State program, Kenny Guyton stepped in, Cardell Jones stepped in, JT Barrett stepped in. Why can't Stephen Collier step Law in? Law of averages. <laughs> <laughs> four in a row would be too many. Yeah. But it's interesting that JT Barrett was coming in in the red zone the last couple of weeks, or at least last week before he was named the starter. And everyone was asking, well, if he's good enough, to play in the red zone, why isn't he good enough to play outside of the red zone? And Cardell really struggling against Penn State early on kind of solidified that. Do you think that Urban will still try to use Cardell as a decoy, or are we just done with him at this point at the quarterback you're position? You're done with him. Like I said, if you don't have the wide receiver that can stretch the field, there's no point in bringing Cardell Jones into the game. In fact, at this point, if you're bringing Cardell Jones into the game, you're telegraphing you're going to try and throw the ball down the field, which they haven't been able to do even when teams aren't thinking they're going to do it. Cardell Jones will not take a meaningful snap for Ohio State this season unless Barrett gets hurt. Sure. All right, we will see how it plays out. Hopefully no one jump passes you guys on cameras on Friday <laughs> or Saturday. <laughs> I'm going to talk to him, not me. He's going to my home state. But let's, uh, let's close with an interesting question, and I'm assuming it originates from the ending to the Michigan-Michigan State game, which was wild. What is the most crazy or the craziest ending you have witnessed in person to a sporting event? Wow. You, you made me think. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah, I was trying to think about this uh, when I when you gave us the questions the other day. Uh, I've seen a lot of memorable endings. I don't know if I would call it anything nearly as crazy as what happened to Michigan in the Michigan State game, but uh, I was there for Holy Buckeye. That was a great ending, but that wasn't the last play of the game. Uh, I, I do remember we had at the state baseball tournament for Coldwater a couple of years ago, the uh, team committed an error. It was, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, the, the team that was always down there. Uh, they picked the guy off second when, when, base. Was it Wheelersburg? Wheelersburg, yes. Right. Wheelersburg picked the Cavalier guy off second base, had him dead to right, they threw the ball away. Coldwater scores a winning run in state semifinal game. So that, that comes to mind and, and some other uh, fantastic finishes. But I don't know if I've ever seen a finish as unlikely as what happened with Michigan, Michigan State. You By brought the, up Purdue. That two of the games that jumped to my mind that I saw in person were the 2011 game Ohio State at Purdue and the 2012 game Purdue at Ohio State. With in 11, Ohio State had a chance to escape Purdue with a victory, scored a touchdown the last play, and the extra point would have won it. They missed the extra point, lost in overtime. And then the following year in Columbus, where they were down eight with just seconds left, and they got the touchdown, and the two-point conversion went on and won in overtime. But yeah, that that Michigan Michigan State ending was just fantastically crazy. I, I, it'll Still be hard can't for believe us. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's hard to. I mean, and other than the band is on the field, yeah. or I, I don't know, I can't even think Abichek of any other. stole the ball. Yeah, I, there's game, just game six of the '86 World Series with Buck near the sure. ground between the legs that scored Ray Knight. Mookie yep. Wilson was a bat for Joe your beloved Pissar Mets. Chicks, yeah. But see, that game was already tied at that point. Game six was already tied at the, after that when the error happened. So all that it did was allow the Mets to win it then instead of maybe winning sure. in the next inning. You didn't have the dramatic role reversal where right. Michigan was 10 right. seconds away from winning. Yeah, I, it, I still bizarre. can't believe it. I, had, I was listening to the radio call on WJR with George Blaha, the voice of Michigan State, and, you know, fourth down, Spartans turned it over. I turned it off. And I'm like <laughs> – it was like, all right, it's over. Michigan got a win. Good for them. I'm literally walking in the door, and my phone is buzzing, and I can't repeat the messages that were coming off on my phone. But you brought up Wheelersburg and baseball. Mm -hmm. Ryan Cowsey still stayed for Lime Central Catholic underneath yeah. the Wheelersburg <laughs> tag. Uh, I, I would say that there, one moment to me locally that I remember, one that sticks out to me, and, Todd, you were on the play-by-play -play of this. Lima Central Catholic versus Sales, 2005 playoffs, round one at the stadium, the last game on the grass. Mm -hmm. And Versailles was the defending state champ. Yeah. It was their coach, Al, I think it was Al Hetrick. Al Hetrick, yeah. It was his last, turned out to be his last game as the head coach. They, in overtime, they score, they go for the PAT, it gets blocked, game over. Yeah. Yeah, those are, there's a lot of great endings through the years, mm -hmm. uh, but as, as far as, you know, Coach Tressel always said that the punt's the most important play in football, and it's also the most dangerous. Think of how many things can go wrong in a punt. 
Let's say the Michigan punter caught that ball. He probably would have got the punt block. They were just all over. Oh, yeah. It. I mean, you can drop the snap. They can snap it over your head. You can get the punt blocked. There's a lot of bad things that can happen on a punt when you, tra when you have to get the punt off. And, and I think we saw that. But, uh, you know, Purdue's been the scene of a, another great moment for me. Bowling Green scored late on a pass, the <laughs> same exact corner as Holy Buckeye the year before. I had been there for that. I was there in 2003. Again at Falcons Purdue, three and, at Ross and then this year the Falcons scored at Purdue with nine seconds to go to win the game. So a lot of good endings at Ross Aid Stadium. Although I will say I was there for one that was bad. The Boilermakers got behind Michael Doss for a touchdown yeah. from Drew Brees and uh, clinched a Rose Bowl berth. I think right. that was '99. Yep, somewhere in there. Uh, so a lot of I've seen a lot of great endings at Ross Aid. That's for sure. <laughs> How lucky are we to get to be at all these games? My my game was Super Bowl 46 when the Giants defeated the Patriots only because Ahmad, Ahmad Bradshaw had to fall backwards into the end zone and I wasn't sure whether to celebrate or if I thought they get left Tom Brady too much time. So what's supposed to be pure elation for the game winning touchdown in the Super Bowl, I didn't know what to do, but it, it ended up all good anyway. But that was, that was fun going back thinking of all those games and still can't get over that Michigan Michigan State game. Well, thank you for joining us on Press Row this week. We'll be right back here next week and enjoy your games over the weekend.